I'm going to introduce our speaker today. I'm really excited to hear, uh, to introduce to you Dr. Alistair Bettiger. Dr. Bettiger is an assistant professor at Stanford University. He did his PhD work in Mike Levine's lab in, at UC Berkeley, and then he went on to do his postdoc at Harvard with Dr. Zhaowei Jing, and where he learned the super resolution microscopy. And then he ba began his lab in 2016. And since then, he's won numerous awards highlighting his innovative work, and just a couple of them uh, to name just to name a few. He is a Beckman Young Investigator. He has a Packard Fellowship, and he's a, he has a new innovator award at the NIH. Uh, so we're really excited to hear what he has to say today and probably see some really beautiful images. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Bettiger today. Thank you. Thank you, Christine, for the introduction and for the invitation to uh, speak today uh, and colleagues. And uh, thank you all for uh, uh, joining us. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on your time zone. So today I'd like to tell you about some of our work in uh, visualizing uh, genome folding and gene expression during development. Before we launch in, I'd like to motivate things by discussing some of the context that uh, has gotten me excited about this question. Just really in understanding uh, how long range cis regulation works in the genome and what all of those non-coding sequences are doing. Uh, a question I got fascinated in as a, a graduate student that I've been trying to understand since. So as uh, many of you know, much of our genome is not uh, coding genes per se. Uh, they make up a relatively small fraction of the total sequence of uh, many metazoan genomes. But it's instead uh, where and when we express these genes and in which combinations that uh, lead to the wonderful diversity uh, of life. So an individual gene will be expressed in different tissues and at different times throughout development and in combinations with other genes. And this is enabled by these non-coding regulatory sequences that lie scattered throughout the genome. And a couple of things that are really interesting and uh, both confusing and exciting about this. One, they're, they're quite distributed. Uh, they can be quite far away from the genes that they regulate, uh, thousands to even millions of base pairs. Uh, some of them hop over uh, intervening genes, apparently, uh, in their regulation. Uh, some genes are regulated by multiple enhancers and uh, some uh, enhancers control uh, multiple genes. And uh, we have a, a limited ability to predict exactly who's going to regulate who, uh, which is something we need to be able to understand if we want to understand how changes in the core genome sequence are going to lead to uh, changes in development. And for a long time, our community has postulated that part of the answer to this specificity lies in understanding the three-dimensional folding of this sequence to mediate which of these sequences get to interact. It's actually an exciting time in the past uh, uh, decade to study the three-dimensional structure of the genome, in part due to the rapid advances that many of you will be aware of in uh, understanding and studying genome structure, uh, particularly led by this class of technologies, these chromatin confirmation capture approaches, uh, which uh, study genome structure uh, through this creative and indirect approach of taking this uh, intact nucleus or polymer structure, cutting it up with uh, enzymes, and then ligating it back together uh, with the uh, goal of studying these elements that uh, by nearby in 3D positions are more likely to ligate uh, together. And you can map these novel junctions with uh, your favorite approach. You do this in uh, whole genome beak sequencing. Uh, it's called the HiC, and the results are often plotted in heat maps like this. We'll be seeing a bunch of these throughout the talk. Uh, again, many of you may be familiar with these by now. We've seen a lot of them in the literature in the last uh, decade, but I will briefly recap. Uh, what is plotted here is just each axis is distance along the genome. And uh, the uh, color of the uh, pixel corresponds to the amount of contacts or the frequency at which a particular ligation event was detected between one piece of the genome on the x-axis and a piece of the genome on that axis. So the diagonal is naturally uh, quite bold as everything contacts itself or contacts other things quite near it. But some surprising observations, the incredible amount of structure observed uh, in the genome. Uh, and the community has been particularly interested in understanding these boxes, which have been called TADs, 
some of these off diagonal points that have been called loops and some checkerboard effects, which you can't see on here, which are called compartments. Despite the incredible amount of knowledge that I think we've learned about how genomes are organized and some of the components that organize them, there are a few limitations to this uh, population uh, level sequencing approach to studying genome structure, especially with related to the questions that I opened up with on the previous slide. It requires relatively large numbers of cells to be able uh, to get the sequencing uh, depth to get the uh, good coverage in this map. Many of you are familiar, there are indeed single cell variants of this, but uh, they're intrinsically, I think, quite sparse. Once you ligate any two pieces of the genome together, you don't get to see that piece connected to anything else. So uh, a single cell map does not look like, or if uh, you test the same question, you can with the population average. You also, in the process, lose the cell-cell variation. It's difficult to use in tissues and embryos where it can be challenging to get a large number of uh, purified cells of a single population. The approach is also looking at pairwise interaction, which are very interesting, but are only one of the questions that we're interested in as a community. Some of the models, for example, of how one enhancer might regulate two promoters or vice versa, intrinsically invite us to ask three-way interaction questions, and we can do this with these pairwise techniques. We're also not looking at structure per se, we're looking at uh, a average contact frequency map and uh, several different structural models may underlie the same ensemble average of contacts. The approach has discarded the rest of the cell. So we've lost the spatial information about the tissue from which they uh, came, from which cells were near which other cells, for example, or near signaling centers uh, within the tissue. We've also lost the RNA, which if we're interested in understanding the link between structure and gene expression, might be one of the components we're particularly interested in, especially as we drill down from population approaches to single cell approaches. And finally, it's, it's moderately expensive. Uh, despite the uh, rapidly decreasing cost of uh, sequencing in uh, past years, that's leveled off a little bit. And this is a very sequencing greedy approach. Uh, uh, typical experiments these days may run into the billions of read counts. Uh, for high resolution data. So if you want to do that over many cell types or many mutants, uh, the expenses start to add up. So one thing we've been interested to do is if we can complement some of the strengths of this approach and help address some of these limitations using an alternative way. And we've been uh, tackling this in a, in a simplistic microscopist approach of can we look and see what is the structure of the nucleus? Uh, if we chemically fix these nuclei, we can put them under our microscope. They're not moving around in these experiments, which is gonna be important for uh, how we're actually able to visualize these structures. Uh, and we can label the genomic regions of interest that we'd like to see with uh, a tile of fluorescent probes indicated here by all these little red marks. And this is just fluorescent situ hybridization. This is technique uh, it's been in the field for a while, originally developed by Joe Gall, but uh, has evolved quite a lot in uh, recent years, especially with the ability of synthetic probes to uh, really optimize uh, both sequence binding uh, and density of labeling. If each of these little oligos bound to the DNA carries a fluorophore, then we might hope to visualize this structure under fluorescent microscope. However, if you take this labeled cell and you stick it under your microscope, you see not this beautiful polymer structure like I've sketched dramatically here, but a tiny diffraction limited blob and you can zoom in and blow it up as much as you like, which I've done in the little image down here. Uh, and uh, it doesn't get any better resolution. The problem here is not an issue with the magnification of your microscope. The issue is the fundamental limits of physics uh, and in particular the uh, finite uh, large wavelength of visible light the structures that we're trying to see, namely the folds of these 10 nanometer chromatin fibers are much smaller than the wavelength of light that we're using just to get some 500 nanometer light. One can circumvent this resolution problem in a number of ways. Uh, an approach I spent a lot of time with my uh, postdoctoral training working on is stochastical optical reconstruction microscopy or STORM, uh, where we activate individual fluorophores uh, through uh, stochastic blinking and image them one at a time. 
which can turn this diffraction limited blob showing on the cutaway into something with a lot more structure. Uh, well, these structural patterns do reveal a bunch of interesting information about the underlying chromatin structure. They are difficult to translate and to compare to some of these uh, sequencing based techniques because we don't have positional information along the genome. I don't know where in this blob my gene lies. Is are my enhancer, my promoter at the base of this loop, or are they shoved away in one of these domains? Uh, to get that sort of information, we've turned to an alternative approach that has some uh, conceptual similarities. The first trick is to replace each of the floor fours on these oligo tags with little DNA barcodes. These are orthogonal sequences to the genome. And they're, uh, each unique color here is a unique sequence. We can then label a particular one of those sequences by flowing in fluorescently tagged complementary oligos that will bind these. And this lights up a small portion of the genome. Again, because of diffraction, we actually get a rather relatively larger spot in our detector. But again, from the fundamental properties of physics, the light here is emitted isotropically. The diffraction is also isotropic. So their spot lies in the perfect center of this. And we can actually fit the uh, area captured on our detector, as we do with other single molecule supervised solution microscopy approaches to subpixel accuracy and find exactly where that uh, point lies. We record this, we do the spitting in three dimensional space, showing here only a 2D image for simplicity. Uh, and then we add complementary probes that actually strip off the uh, fluorescently labeled oligos. This causes the image to go dark, and we can add probes for the next region down the chain. We get another spot. It's in almost exactly the same location, but because we're visualizing them one at a time, we don't have this diffraction problem of overlap. We can again fit the central with very high accuracy. We can record the point and we can see it's moved ever so slightly in three dimensional space. And if you just iterate this process one at a time, we can march one step at a time down the genome in whatever interval you wish to walk until we've reconstructed a three-dimensional trajectory uh, of the portion of the genome in this individual cell. So our super resolution reconstructed image has substantially more resolution than this diffraction limited image. And it now has sequence information. And I should mention the, the data in these plots that I'll show in this polymer organization are just these, these spheres uh, and the smooth line connecting them is just to guide your eye through the colors in the correct order. Because once we get past 10, I think it's hard for my eye to distinguish. We can represent this data, not just as in this polymer view, but also as a matrix, where this is just barcode number or position along the genome. And now instead of contact frequency, we have actually absolute distance in units of nanometers. Uh, and this is just for the individual single polymer shown here. Uh, Below, where each of these uh, rows and columns is a different barcode uh, in our matrix, which again represents position along the genome. In uh, an homage to Storm, the uh, students decided to call this uh, optical reconstruction of chromatin architecture. It's uh, no longer stochastic, but it's still an optical reconstruction method of looking at spots one at a time. Uh, and because we exploit this unique property of uh, DNA that we can know the, how the sequence changes along its length. It's very particular to chromatin. It's not as general a super resolution approach as storm. Is. I'll say some brief words too about uh, throughput. Uh, as you note, these uh, 65 sequential labeling reactions take some substantial amount of time. Typical experiment takes us a couple of days to uh, uh, a week or so. Uh, Ultimately, we can actually analyze many more cells than we were able to do previously uh, with the STORM approach because we can visualize large numbers of cells at every barcode step. So at the end of that week, we may have 2,000 to 10,000 cells, uh, even though it has taken the full week to get just uh, any one of those. We haven't completed the image until the, the end of the, uh, the time period. Whereas with uh, stochastic blinking techniques like STORM, uh, the requirement for high power lasers I mean we do very many fewer cells uh, at a time. So uh, an individual cell might only take 20 minutes to an hour, but getting up to 100,000 takes a very long time.
I'd also like to make a shout out to uh, uh, a number of colleagues who have started to proliferate these sequential hybridization methods, uh, especially for studying uh, genome structure. I think it's, uh, as I hope to convince you today, an exciting uh, and burgeoning uh, field. And my uh, former colleague, uh, Steve Wang, has done some beautiful work at the chromosome scale and some more recent work uh, at the, uh, which is on the bioarchive now, also at this uh, scale of PES. Uh, and uh, colleagues too in uh, CNRS uh, in France have done some beautiful uh, conceptually similar work as well, looking at uh, a slightly uh, lower resolution stepping along the genome. What we're looking here. But first, uh, does it does it work? So. Uh, a, a simple control, we can ask, can we see some of the same structural features that uh, the community has been interested in and has been detecting by HIC with uh, microscopy? Or is this polymer trace that I just showed you primarily reflecting, for example, the uncorrected drift of the microscope? In fact, to get this to work robustly, for example, you do need to be very careful about tracking fiducial markers and making sure you do correct vibrational drift. But can we? we test just how well we're doing at that. Well, if we take many of these uh, cells, and this is actually going to be an aggregate of about 10,000, uh, we can plot the frequency of which any two of these balls come within proximity of one another. And this particular map that cutoffs are going to be 150 nanometers. Uh, the map looks qualitatively similar between about 75 and uh, something north of 200 or 250. And as you start to get past that, more things start to blur out. Uh, so this is the absolute frequency, the fraction of cells in the data set this would be, that have uh, any of these two balls within uh, this cutoff distance. We can compare this to the high resolution high C data available for this same uh, cell line. Uh, here using some of the beautiful data from uh, Eris Liebman Hiding's lab published in 2014 for 90 cells. Uh, we can see, in fact, that we uh, resolve many of these similar structures. Draw your attention to the uh, differences in the units here, where in one case we're collecting fraction of cells under some contact distance, and we're collecting normalized read count after sequencing and doing some interesting matrix balancing magic. Uh, so in principle, these are reasonably different quantities. We might not expect them. I certainly did not expect them to agree quite so well, uh, but actually quantitatively, these two maps correlate quite nicely. And we see many of the same qualitative features. These uh, boxes on diagonals, these boxes within boxes called subpads, uh, these little uh, off diagonal points uh, called uh, loops uh, or corner points by some that uh, associate with CCCF sites and these traits. Uh, and this is so not all uh, high C data achieves the resolution achieved in this study. And there, uh, in some cases, we're actually getting better uh, resolution of these population average structures uh, from the microscopy data. Of course, the exciting part of the microscopy approach is not merely to reproduce the type of measurements that we can make uh, already with the high C and the deep sequencing but take advantage of the additional orthogonal information that we can incorporate into the study. And Matthew Taylor, who in the lab has been leading this work on trying to bring this uh, into tissue and to look at cell type specific differences within tissues. What I'm showing here is then a section through uh, some Drosophila embryos that uh, Wesley has uh, cryosectioned. And each one of these little white dots is the bithorax cluster. Uh, important portion of the genome for regulating developmental patterning within uh, an individual cell. And we can take any one of these and blow up this diffraction limit image of the, that portion of the genome to a three-dimensional structure. This particular region is about a 330 kb domain and is tiled with uh, at about three kilobase resolution. So it hasn't stopped with measuring the structure in this spatially organized way. Because the tissue is intact, all of the RNA is also still uh, present within the sample. And using a similar sequential labeling technique, what she's done here is to label mature cytoplasmic RNA transcripts for a battery of genes that are distinctive of the different cell types that you can see that pattern the embryo at this stage. 
Uh, and if we zoom in on one of these spots, we get nice single molecule fish spots, which uh, if you overlay too many colors like we started to do here, it becomes a little hard to tell apart, but uh, that we can count and get a nice molecular characterization of the cell state corresponding to this uh, genome structure. Additionally, we decided to label intronic uh, portions of a couple of the genes, including the uh, Hox genes inside this uh, regulatory domain that she's uh, been interested in studying. Uh, and here we get bright spots uh, when the gene is actively transcribed corresponding to the nascent RNA as we label those introns. So you can, of course, quantify all of this information. We can quantify the three-dimensional structure in a single cell in one of these pairwise distance maps. We can quantify the relative levels of nascent RNA and the absolute molecule counts of mature mRNA. One of the most exciting aspects of the data set is the relative throughput is actually quite high. So in a single experiment of about a week, uh, there's one cell, here's another cell, and in a single every experiment of about a week, Leslie has collected about 30,000 cells uh, in this data set. Uh, the total number of RNA species is about 30, numbering about half a million transcripts in all if you add up all of the cells. And for each of these cells, we've also measured the genome structure of uh, this important Hox complex. So this gives now a lot of information to explore about how structure informs expression and how a cell state might shape genome structure. So today I'd like to highlight a few applications uh, that we've been using this to help understand the uh, links between chromatin structure and gene regulation. I have a, a brief section on the physical nature of TADS. So I think it's still an important discussion and a point that uh, of some debate and lack of clarity in the field. So I will do this quickly since it's published. I'll give a few highlights to uh, in our understanding of the role of chromatin folding in development uh, in the context of Drosophila. And then we'll take a brief pause for discussion. Uh, seeing how we're doing on time, I'd like to lead in, leave us off with uh, some of the paradoxes in genome structure and function and uh, how a little bit of uh, modeling work informed by our uh, microscopy imaging and uh, help us resolve some of those paradoxes. All right, our first question, what is a TAD? I think we all have an intuitive sense of what a TAD is and actually despite much debate over the terminology in the field, I think everyone actually agrees. These uh, boxes that you see on the diagonal are what we call TADs. Uh, I appreciate Victor Corsis's playful renaming of triangles at diagonals. Uh, and uh, it is actually quite useful in the field to have uh, a simple terminology to refer to the boxes on the diagonal. But what do they arise from? And I think this has been at the uh, center of much of the debate. We often draw them in our reviews like this as uh, portions of a polymer and in an individual cell that are completely separated from one another, which is very provocative. It leads to hypotheses and models such as this, like. Uh, a clear understanding of why the enhancers in CAD1 only regulate genes in CAD1. We'll come back to that. It doesn't have to look like this, though, to give rise to this sort of data. Some beautiful simulations from Leonid Murney's lab, for example, have shown uh, that uh, you can simulate polymer behaviors doing phenomena such as loop extrusion uh, and give rise to maps that look quite like what I show you here. Though no individual cell shows anything near this degree of separation that we frequently draw. So many different ensembles can give rise to the same average. And uh, this is something that uh, Bogdan Bintu and uh, Leslie Mateo, two grad students I've had the pleasure to work with, really wanted to understand. And Bogdan was a, a student who uh, started working with me. He was in uh, Xiao Wei Zhang's lab. Uh, he's just wrapped up his work. Are TADs truly a, a physical unit of folding that is, exists in individual cells? Or is this uh, an emergent property of purely pairwise interactions through the genome uh, that doesn't have an otherwise uh, structural clumpy organization? This is something we can address directly from the uh, imaging data. So let's take a look at a couple structures. Uh, here is uh, one cell from the domain that I just showed you. 
And at first block, or might uh, there are two blocky domains. So are, are, are these counts? Well, let's take another cell. Same cell line, same genomic region, but now there are three boxes, and some off diagonal uh, interactions uh, as well, depending on who gets in proximity with who. Uh, another example, two, but in a different place, and, and, and so forth. Uh, so while there is this apparent block-like organization uh, here to the genome, and it's tempting to call these uh, tags, we can see these positions don't all are not all of the same place in all of the cells. In fact, we can quantify the frequency of these jumps, which is what we've done here. This is the single cell boundary frequency. And it, these average transitions of the types of jumps that we see in single cells actually nicely align with the CTCF sites in this uh, uh, cell line uh, and with the, uh, with the high C boundary. So from this, we've concluded that the population level TADs that we see when we do one of these uh, high C-like assays or we average together the microscopy data really are an emergent statistical property of the chromatin, but they are not stable structural entities. And uh, to be provocative uh, in the uh, manuscript, we call these TAD-like domains, uh, emphasizing in this way of plotting the uh, uh, similarities in the appearance, but uh, I think it would be inappropriate to uh, co-opt the word TADS to describe these variable structures that we see in single cells. It's been quite useful in the literature to call TADS the domains where you can also tell someone what the precise genomic coordinates of those are. Another surprise for me from this was the frequency of relatively well segregated domains, which was rather distinct from some of the modeling predictions where purely pairwise interactions uh, would drive this structure, but uh, two domains would rarely show quite such high segregation uh -huh. as we find in some of our cells. Now the field in my dogma has taken up uh, the following structural analogy, which I, I think is worth breaking down, uh, showing the, uh, a beautiful summary of it here from a review from uh, Giacomo Cavalli's lab that you'll find this dogma uh, throughout the, uh, the literature that the genome is organized into separate structures across scales, that the finest scale is this 10 nanometer chromatin fiber, and that that folds up into a higher order structure called a TAD, which associate into these higher order structures called compartments, which themselves form up higher order structures called chromosome territory. And there are a few adjustments we need to make to this uh, canonical uh, dogma been highly motivated from these beautiful genome-wide high-C data of uh, where you can indeed nicely see chromosome territories, compartments, and tags at distinct length scales. Starting at the largest scale, the chromosome territory appears indeed to be a legitimate structure. This was uh, known for a while, originally from some beautiful experiments by the uh, Kramer brothers, uh, uh, once they've also developed uh, highly multiplex fish is a more recent set of experiments from the uh, Kramer lab showing uh, individual chromosomes indeed occupying their largely segregated uh, territories. And you can see this nice map here. If we turn instead to uh, the compartment scale and we look at a boundary between two compartments, we find that this uh, structural analogy does not continue. Well, uh, we can nicely delineate different portions of the genome in the population average, if we look at individual cells, sometimes two compartments here separated in the red and blue from based on their population level calls are nicely segregated. It does happen in a fraction of the cells. The fraction of cells, we also see degrees of intermixing or these sort of border violations. Uh, so this compartment is not a stable structure the way the chromosome territory or the nucleus is a stable structure. And the same is true for cats. Uh, Statistically, if we average enough of these together, uh, we find that there are transitions that occur at particular positions along the genome. But an individual cell does not have the structural pattern uh, seen in the tag. What molecular process then creates this organization and might also help us understand this uh, variability? Well, one of the, I think, very 
exciting uh, experiments recently described in the field, uh, showing here some data from HiC from Eris Lieberman Eiding's lab, uh, was uh, discussing the role of cohesin and CTCF. Uh, cohesin, as several groups had commented on, uh, was preferentially associated at these pad boundaries. Uh, and then experiments in 2017, uh, work in uh, the Lieberman lab using an oxen dagron, nicely showed removing cohesin really led to the uh, collapse of this structure and the disappearance of these pad-like features. Should mention similar experiments done by uh, Francois Spitz's labs and uh, also by Benoit Brunou and Elphage Nora uh, looking at uh, CTCF and FDL uh, reached similar conclusions. So the factors that associated the boundaries seem to help create some of these structures. We can nicely test this with microscopy as well. So this is just a validation. This is now used in the ORCA approach to study the same cell line without degradation. If we look at the average picture of many cells, just to show there's nothing funny going on in the data, uh, we nicely again recapitulate the results seen by high C that we've uh, lost much of the structural features uh, in the population aggregate. But if we look at individual cells, we have these block-like structures appearing uh, in the wild type case, as I already showed you, and those persist in the uh, absence of cohesin, which I think is surprising to some, not surprising to some. The fact that these boundaries were already variable gives you a hint that these are not uh, identical to the structured tags of the population average. So what is cohesin then doing? Cohesin is apparently not playing a dominant role in whether or not the genome is packaged in this blocky organization or not but it is playing a strong role in repartitioning the genome to create this statistical preference for those jumps to occur at certain positions. And when we remove cohesin, the position of these jumps actually becomes completely uniform across this portion of the genome. Uh, some of the experts familiar with the literature will also know uh, this is only true within a, a common compartment type. So this uh, three megabase region here is all uh, actually a compartment A zone. But uh, within it, the position of these boundaries become random after removing cohesin. Right. Our second experimental question then is, now we understand a little bit more of what the structure of the genome actually looks like in a physical sense, uh, and what some of the uh, statistical nature of some of the features we've been measuring. We ask, how does this genome really change in development? And to what role is the structural features that we measure predictive or informative of the transcriptional state and the ultimate cell fate? This work was also done by Leslie, working instead of in human cell culture, like the previous work I just described, working in this beautiful model system provided by the Drosophila embryo. This is the embryo at about uh, 12 hours uh, post-fertilization, where it has uh, separated out the different segments of the body illustrated here by the conserved Hox genes expressed in the anterior posterior fashion, which uh, are master regulators of anterior posterior fate. And because she can study genome structure in these cryo sections that I introduced earlier, we can then take an individual tissue type like these cells that will eventually become the third leg of the adult animal uh, and ask, how is the genome folded up in one of these domains? So if we look here in T3, uh, we're gonna look again at this uh, portion of the Hox complex in Drosophila, which contains these three genes, UBX, ABDA, and ABB. Uh, and in T3, only UBX is expressed, and it's expressed at relatively low levels, and it's doing so under control of these intronic enhancers. It's another reason for choosing this domain. Uh, about 50 years of beautiful sophogenics had already worked out a lot of these details for us. Leslie painted clean across the bithorax domain here with uh, about 60 probes, and then imaged the structure and showing an example of an individual cell here. 
which you can see the some interactions between NO and UBX uh, enhancers and its promoter, uh, and uh, a nice structural partition, which uh, is representative of the same type of partition we see in the average map if we now look at the relative contact frequency. I've turned that uh, box now onto its diagonal, which makes it easier to plot the genes here. Uh, and we are now looking at uh, a relative uh, contact frequency relative to the, uh, the tissue as a whole. We just average all of the cells. So if we see red, they see higher uh, associations than expected uh, and blue less association than expected. So here in this third leg, the UBX domain is nicely separated away from the rest of the cluster. Uh, and in so doing, the promoter has been encapsulated in this small tad with these intronic enhancers. If we move just a little more posterior to this uh, first abdominal segment, uh, we actually find a different folding pattern in the Cox domain. UBX is still the only gene that's on. So this change in structure does not uh, neatly uh, recapitulate changes in the transcription units that are active. It does, however, now associate this UBX promoter primarily with the upstream region that it wasn't associated with in T3. And this upstream region actually contains more UBX enhancers, enhancers that are actually only important for abdominal patterning or are not important for this T3 patterning, but that drive somewhat higher levels of UBX uh -huh, required for uh, abdominal cell phase. And this pattern continues as we march more posteriorly in segment A2, the gene ABDA is active and it's under control of these downstream enhancers and it associates in a neat little tad with those enhancers. As we move here to A3, we find uh, this tad has expanded. It now includes the upstream enhancers of ABDA as well uh, and ABDA is expressed at slightly higher levels in these more posterior cells. Some other interesting features that pop out of this data we see. Uh, so there are clearly structural changes that are happening as we move between different cell types, at least at this particular piece of the genome. It's a highly regulated, important developmental control locus. The transitions occur at particular positions along the genome that interestingly uh, coincide with uh, genomic loci marked by uh, CTCF, which I'm showing you the chip track of. It is not the only protein at these uh, domains and is probably not functioning alone to uh, create and help promote these borders. We also see there are uh, enhancer promoter interactions tend to occur within domains. We really don't see stabilized loop between known enhancers and promoters. So I'm just circling a couple examples of the tracing up the enhancer to promoter across several of these domains. There's UBX and its intronic enhancers, there's its upstream enhancers, and none of these are bright red points in a sea of something uh, that's interacting less. And that makes it very hard to uh, accept this classical textbook picture of these stable enhancer promoter loops where the transcription factors are interacting with other factors at the promoter, maybe stabilized by molecules like cohesin. Uh, if that were true, we would see uh, specific loop interactions here. Another interesting feature showing here the population averages again of these different cell types, but we can go and look at individual cells. And we see one of these little active CADs. We actually find it is not a compact domain as might be suggested by the high frequency of interaction between all pairs, but really a uh, a composition of transient loops that just preferentially form interdomain. What we mean by that is maybe easier if we look at a couple examples. So here you can see actually a rather extended UBX domain. Uh, and there's uh, many of the components of this uh, domain are actually quite far apart from each other, but a couple are in proximity. And which two are in proximity actually changes uh, quite a lot across the cell population. And hence, when we average these together, you see one of these domains. I'd just like to contrast that from the structure we see in this more posterior portion. In the population average map, this also appears as a region where everybody is in relatively high frequency contact with other elements within the domain, isolated from those without. We actually look in individual examples at this portion of the polymer structure 
uh, we more frequently do find truly compact structures uh, within this uh, repressed domain. So additional features that get uh, lost on population averaging within, even within the subtype. Here's just another example, again, showing this much more compacted region of the, uh, it's hard to see with all the overlay of the blue, purple, magenta uh, portion of the genome and the rather more decompact with uh, occasional pairwise interactions in the extra DBX region. So from this uh, model, I suggested that we've, uh, uh, it is hard to reconcile with these stable enhancer promoter interactions. Might make a side comment, uh, which I should update here, but uh, about the current debates about action at a distance, we actually do see a nice correlation uh, still to forming the structure and finding increased interaction. So it also does not seem to be action at a distance, but what, what is, if not a stable promoter loop consistent with uh, the data? Uh, Another model that has been posed in the literature is this idea of uh, a dynamic and interactive enhancer scan or promoter scan that uh, the uh, chromatin is moving, the promoter is exploring different uh, portions of the genome looking for other regulatory elements and it's doing so in a restricted manner. It has some uh, insulator elements or components that tell it how far to explore. This type of interaction uh, is much more consistent with this type of snapshot that we've captured or the uh, formation of these whole domains, which connect the enhancer, the promoter, and really everything in between, uh, as instead of simple loops. Another question we've uh, commonly gotten and we're asked ourselves as well: uh, To what extent does the instantaneous domain structure that we see in any individual cell uniquely define its cell type? We're familiar with protein with this effect in protein structure. Uh, is this true at the level of the genome? Uh, the answer is, I think, quite a definitive no. And let me walk you through a couple examples on how we can see this. We take individual cells from, say, T3 or A1. We can see quite a lot of variability, which maybe you should expect, as also seen in the human cell data. If we average these together, though, we get clearly distinct uh, maps. And I think an analogy helps to us understand how we are thinking of how do you maintain identity if the differences between cell to cell are uh, sometimes greater than the, uh, the differences in the population? I think the following uh, analogy will help. We imagine, uh, we haven't measured the dynamics directly, as I mentioned before, these are fixed cells, but that an individual cell in any one of these cell types is sampling between these different conformations. We'd love to be able to measure the kinetic rates associated with that. And that it is this ensemble of states that really distinguish uh, the cell type. This is, as an analogy, if we were imagining we were taking photographs of two different gases. Here we have two folks doing a waltz, and here are Charleston. But if I show you only two snapshots, I think uh, it's impossible to distinguish what dance is being performed. But if we have multiple snapshots, even if we can't measure the dynamics, we have multiple snapshots of the separate populations, it now becomes clear uh, what the differences are uh, in these two. So we would like to propose that the chromosomes are also dancing and that it is the relative frequency of all of the different physical states that distinguishes functionally the behavior of that cell rather than the instantaneous structure, not thus emphasizing only the structures we see in the average map, like here is a tag boundary, but uh, really the complete ensemble of positions, much like it is the complete ensemble of moves and positions that define the uh, one dance or make it distinct. Uh, So what mechanisms are regulating the dance? I think I may, in the interest of time, tie up uh, with this last note, and we will just have some highlights on the directions we are going. So I'm going a bit slower than I hoped. So we've been interested in these understanding what actually establishes this physical separation between domains. Here is just one of the cell types I had shown you previously. Uh, these cells are expressing both UBX and ABA. And yet, 
these two express genes don't like to co-associate with one another. Uh, why? Uh, and uh, notably, uh, since it had been postulated in the field, especially in the context of Drosophila, that the epigenetic state is really the only thing driving the chromatin. This is a nice counterexample. Clearly, these two genes are in the same epigenetic state, but we still have a nice border here. Uh, so to understand uh, what molecular component and what portions of the genome are instructive for this folding, uh, we examined the deletion of a border element uh, right here. And this uh, border deletion was uh, uh, performed by Welcome Bender's lab. He had removed about a four kilobase sequence within this uh, uh, now about 700 kilobase domain that I'm showing you here uh, between these genes UBX and ABDA. Uh, in the wild type, as I just showed you, we typically find these two domains quite well separated. Uh, and in cells in which this border has been deleted, there's again uh, variability, there is still a dance of structures, but a much higher frequency uh, of those cells contain uh, examples where we see a significant amount of contact between portions of the uh, ABDA region, here in blue, and uh, UBX uh, here in green that uh, weren't interacting uh, with the same frequency in wild type. Does this expression matter if both genes are on? Uh, in the segments where both genes are expressed, we still see a clear structural pattern where the cells that are expressing uh, UBX at low levels are expressing ABDA at higher levels, and uh, the cells that are expressing UBX at uh, high levels are sometimes not expressing ABDA at all or expressing ABDA at slightly lower levels. So there are clearly distinct patterns for the two genes, even though they're both on within these uh, tissues presumably due to their distinct enhancers. When we disrupt this boundary, we lose this distinction in the pattern of the two genes. The expression pattern of both genes looks much more similar uh, here in, in suggesting that the structural separation really does uh, matter functionally. And I'll just show you the population aggregate data uh, where we had gone from two nice pads separating UBX and uh, ABDA to uh, with a small deletion, uh, really seeing a loss of this uh, clear separation. Uh, and interestingly, this uh, border uh, does align with uh, two of the proteins commonly found to it, mammalian uh, CAD borders. Uh, these, again, are not the only proteins there. They're also not the only proteins at many of the boundaries that we've uh, looked at in mammals. I'll skip through. This is just one more example of a nice little boundary deletion uh, leading to a merger of tabs. This is where I would like to stop uh, and I would love to take uh, questions and in the interest of time since I see I've gone a little slow through that I might wrap up uh, here with some inclusion. So do you want to start speaking? Do you want to start yes, yeah. now or wait till the end? I think, I think I will make this the whole question section. So maybe I'll just do acknowledgements. I have us in at about 10 minutes to the hour. I'd love to give some more time for questions. Okay, so uh, I'll start with some of the questions that have come in Q&A, but I just wanna remind everyone that you can raise your hand uh, and I can unmute you so you can ask the question yourself. Um, okay, so I'll start with some of the technical questions that came early on in the talk. Uh, so Sangjin Kim, asks, how do you simultaneously probe DNA and RNA? And doesn't a probe bind to both? Yeah, it's an excellent question. Uh, we use a trick of we're doing it sequentially. So we actually do the RNA first, because that RNA sequence will be in the DNA. And we do it before we've opened the DNA helix. So uh, hence, the probe only binds the RNA. We then op wash off all those probes. We open the DNA helix. And we add the DNA probes that we've designed to be uh, sent to the strand. So they'll bind the duplex DNA, but they will avoid all of the RNA that's still there. Uh, and this gives us the ability to distinguish. Okay. Uh, and then another technical question from Ilya Flema is how long is each genomic region within the same barcode? And is the spot guaranteed to be diffraction limited? It's a great question. So the spot indeed is, is, is certainly not guaranteed to be diffraction limited. Even a small domain can uh, 
in theory, uh, if you were to stretch out the DNA, uh, could occupy uh, hundreds of nanometers of space. In uh, practice, uh, we can measure different resolutions. What is the, uh, the uh, trajectory that it takes? Uh, and I think the best way to think about it is we have the average of what's in that domain, much like binning the high C uh, gives you the average of that uh, trajectory. So if we're stepping along at 30 kb, which is what was the uh, case in some of the early data, indeed that 30 kb element may be taking excursions that are not seen in that polymer trace. This is the average trace as you went through blurring what the real smaller structure might have been doing uh, at, uh, at 30 kb resolution. And we push that from 30 kb to about 1 kb uh, resolution. Okay. Um, okay, so Ilya also has another question, uh, which is regarding enhancer promoter instacryons within domains. Is the interaction frequency within these domains increased relative to the genomic average, or are they just insulated from neighboring regions? Yeah, that's a great question as well. Uh, so in the case of bithorax, we looked at this in uh, quite closely. They are slightly increased relative to the genomic, uh, sorry, relative to the population average uh, across uh, compared to off cells. Uh, as well as uh, locally increased relative to uh, just correcting for uh, distance, which is actually surprising to me because uh, some of you will know these Hox genes are regulated by polycomb. Uh, they do po adopt a more compact structure when repressed by polycomb, which is the state they're in in much of the cell. And many of those enhancer promoters are actually still closer together in the active cells in their decompact state well, only a fraction of them are in contact, the average is still closer than they were in their uh, compacted. Generally, the whole locus is smaller, but the enhancer and promoter within that dense region are typically a little farther. Okay, uh, so we do have a question, an attendee that's raised a hand. So I'm gonna go ahead and unmute you, uh, Darren Underhill. I think it's Alan Underhill. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so it's, it's been a curse of my life. Um, beautiful work. And I'm just curious, if you look at the, uh, the boundary element between ultrabithorax and abdominal um, A across Drosophila species, is there anything, is it conserved? Is it different length, sequence content? And can that tell you anything about the way it functions to preserve these boundaries? Yeah, it's a fabulous question. That's actually one uh, Welcomes Lab, among others, have, have looked at. Uh, so it, uh, that boundary is nicely conserved across uh, oh, about 30 million years. You get out to Viralis, uh, and actually that, uh, that boundary, the, the, fly, the, the Hox complex in, in Melanogaster is split. It's also split in Viralis, and it's split at a different point. Instead of being split upstream of UBX, it's actually split at that element. So in some okay. species, the genome has stuck those two regions uh, 10 megabases apart instead of letting them be next to each other, which is uh, also interesting for Pretty cool. suggesting that the separation is important. Thanks. Okay, so uh, our next question is from Natalia Kochanova, who says, great talk. Have you looked at mitotic chromosomes with your approach? Yeah, it's a fabulous question. We, we have not, we keep on being tempted to dive in and we have not dove into a uh, Mitotic chromosome. Okay, uh, so we're at 9.57. I'll take a few more questions and then we'll let you do your future and acknowledgement. Good. Does that sound good? Okay. Uh, our next question is from Hilmar Strickfadden. Is it possible to detect an orientation of the A and B compartments with respect to an interchromatin space? Is the A compartment oriented to the nucleoplasma of the interchromatin space and the B compartment to the compact region of the chromatin domains? And second, yeah. mm -hmm. oh, sorry, I can ask the question after you answer it. <laughs> this is an exciting question. I would actually direct you to some recent work from my colleague, uh, Stephen Wang, uh, who also was a, a postdoc me with Xiao Wei and is, now has this lab at Yale uh, on the, uh, the bioarchive. But you can definitely measure that with microscopy uh, and indeed, uh, he does see an orientation dependence 
uh, with uh, many of the uh, compartment structures. It depends a little at what scale to you uh, look at. And um, mm -hmm. their second question is, if TADs exist as highly segregated domains, does the inter-TAD sequence, that's the sequence between the CTCF binding sites of adjacent TADs, uh, act as kind of a linker region? Yeah, it's a great question. What, when we see statistically these things are separated, why are they separated? Is it because there's a large linker and they're two separate blobs like this uh, or not? Uh, we would love to look at more boundary examples for this. It certainly doesn't jump out at you that they are primarily separated by flexible linkers, though, for example, the association of, nice and controversial, active genes uh, being nightly expressed at uh, TAD boundaries, which depending how you normalize and whose data set you look at, you can see a nice association. So uh, some work also shows if you activate a promoter, it's hard to get that, that to have that drive displayed. Uh, this does correlate a little bit. So I think multiple mechanisms including flexible linkers may contribute to these separations. Uh, and it's something we'd love to study further. Okay. Uh, so one last question. Do you know what the time scale of the ge genome dynamics you measure is? This, this, is the, uh, this is the unanswered question that we are hoping to address with some of the, the live imaging approaches we're uh, seeing now. We can measure the diversity of the structure, but we have no data on how long it actually takes one to convert into another, and we would love to know. Okay, so uh, I will stop the questions. There's lots of questions that have come, uh, and hopefully you'll get a chance to answer them later, but um, you can go ahead and do your uh, finish up. I should be happy to reach out by uh, email. I did want to highlight uh, the people who had uh, led much of the work. Uh, this again is uh, Leslie and uh, Bogdan uh, on the first part, and uh, Leslie, with a lot of help from uh, Sedona, led much of the second part I told you about today. What we didn't have time to dive into, which I would love to describe uh, more at another time, is actually trying to understand some of the apparent contradictions in our field uh, about uh, when you change genome structure and you remove a TAD boundary, do you see transcriptional changes? Some experiments suggest you do, some experiments suggest you don't. Uh, we believe uh, that uh, we can actually reconcile a substantial number of these contradictions uh, with uh, a little more uh, detailed modeling of how promoters respond uh, to enhancers. That uh, goes beyond, I think, the intuition we have commonly pushed as a field in the literature of a kind of enhancer loop and gene fire model. In the interest of not pushing way past 10, I think I probably shouldn't dive in too deep. Hey, thank you very, very much. That was a really beautiful, elegant talk. If you want, we can still take a couple more questions uh, before we wrap up so that you can head to the trainee session. Uh, would you like to take a couple of questions? I'll be happy to take a couple of questions. Okay. I'll be happy, and and, uh, if I don't get the questions, feel free to email us to my email. So I'll okay, we also encourage you to put the questions on Discord so we can have discussions great. there. And if do you don't mind that. answering it there, that would be great too. Um, okay, so Andrew Field says, great talk. You mentioned in the intro that one of the advantages of using a microscopy-based technique is that you can observe interactions between more than two loci. In the single cell data, do you often notice loci that interact with two or more partners at a time, or is the contact more consistent, consistent with pairwise interactions? That's a fabulous question. It's not definitely one of the things we're very excited and working on. Uh, so the short answer, uh, large portions of the genome indeed exhibit uh, a good number of the sequences we looked at. We see three-way interactions occurring at substantially higher frequencies than you would predict uh, based on if they were independent pairwise interactions. So there does seem to be a bunch of cooperativity in the genome. Understanding the origins of this uh, effect uh, are challenging. So for example, it does not seem to be exclusive to enhancers forming aggregates and other portions of the genome not doing it, but uh, that needs more work. We also have some examples though of uh, the opposite effect of uh, three-way interactions that occur at lower frequencies than you would expect based on the 
known measured pairwise interactions. So our next question is from Nipin Kumar, who says, we expect the repertoire of chromosome spatial configurations to be equally constrained and conserved at all scales. Would you recapitulate the observation that TAD boundaries tend to be well conserved while compartments tend to be more flexible? Yeah, I think this is an interesting discussion. It depends a little the scale at which one defines uh, these features, but I do think by and large, many of the boundaries we see between uh, genes or these boxes on diagonals uh, do seem to be well conserved. They seem to be well conserved across cell types. Uh, I know I spent much of the talk highlighting the changes in those boundaries at the uh, Cox complex, but uh, uh, some other developmental genes we've looked at in detail uh, don't show changes in structure. They show only changes in which enhancers are active. So I suspect many of the boundaries are conserved across species and conserved across cell type at the, uh, the TAD level. The compartment depends a little at the scale at which one calls uh, compartments. So the scale of the zoomed out chromosome that much of that we frequently plot at say 500 KB resolution also in the human genome correlates very strongly to GC content uh, and is nicely conserved. Where a lot of the changes occurring uh, I think there are boundary switches that are occurring driven by changes of chromatin state between active and repressed and moving between compartments at smaller scales. But it does depend on how you call those compartments, subcompartments, uh, et cetera, for whether you can detect those. And some of the examples I showed at the bithorax are corresponding to changes in epigenetic state, I didn't have a chance to go into, and some are, uh, as the one I highlighted, occurring within an epigenetic state. Okay, so we'll take our last question for the day. Uh, it's from Ariel Afik, who says, amazing talk. It seems the ensemble average is really reproducible. Does the actual confirmations in the ensemble, are the actual confirmations in the ensemble reproducible? And how many populated confirmations do you see? Yeah, I think it's a fabulous question. I think you may stem a little from some of the intuition we get from looking at the uh, ensembles of protein structures, perhaps from cryo -EM. So we don't get, uh, unlike taking cryo-EM structures to be able to dock one into another and make a nice ensemble average. Uh, to first order, there is enough degrees of freedom in the polymers that no two dock convincingly perfectly. Uh, and I might say, uh, if we explore some of the simulation data from uh, Murney and colleagues too, this is a, a property that we, uh, the, might expect from the polymer nature of the chromatin. There's enough degrees of freedom and none of these interactions are stable enough to enrich uh, uh, a substantially large domain such that it docks in the way proteins work before. Okay, thank you very much. We will have more questions on Discord and people can email you too. Um, and thank you for your talk. Uh, we will see you at the speaker training session after this. And thank you everyone else for coming. We hope to see you again next week, same time, same place, different talk. Thank you all for listening. Thank you for a fabulous question.